Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to see you here with the sun shining, um, finally, in this rainy spring. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's conversation at noon here at the Old State House in Hartford. Um, my name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I am the head of public programs, and today's program is sponsored by our organization, the Connecticut Democracy Center. I'd like to draw your attention. I left some goodies for you on your chairs, um, several, several rather flyers about upcoming programs, including the farmers market that started yesterday. It'll take place on Tuesdays and Fridays throughout the summer. I know some of you live locally because I recognize you, um, so do come and do some shopping with us. We also have a, a wonderful concert series. This summer, most of the concerts take place on Fridays, a few Tuesdays. You have the schedule for that. And then next month, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of um, Americans landing on the moon with two conversations at noon. And so we hope you will join us for that. It's always fun to get to welcome back old friends to Connecticut's old state house. We've been doing our conversations at noon for I think close to 10 years now. Um, and so it's a delight to welcome back our friend Susan Campbell. As many of you know, Susan is a distinguished lecturer at the University of New Haven's Department of Communications, Film and Media Studies. She is also a columnist for the Hartford Current and the website Connecticut Health Investigative Team. She's a frequent contributor on issues of housing and homelessness to WNPR and the political website The Hill, as well as the newspaper The Guardian. Susan is an award-winning author of um, Dating Jesus, Fundamentalism, Feminism, and the American Girl, and the biography Tempest Tossed, The Spirit of Isabella Beecher Hooker. Susan was born in Kentucky and raised in southwest Missouri, and for more than a quarter of a century, she was a staff columnist at the Hartford Current, where her work has been recognized by the National Women's Political Caucus, the New England Associated Press News Executives, the Society for Professional Journalists, the American Association of Sunday and Feature Editors, the National Society of Newspaper Columnists, and the Sunday Magazine Editors Association. Her column about the shooting at uh, excuse me, the shootings at Lottery Headquarters in March of 1998 was part of the Current's Pulitzer Prize winning coverage. She returned to um, the Hartford Current as a columnist in March of 2013. Susan has a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland and a master's degree from Hartford Seminary. Today, Susan's going to be speaking about her new book, which will be available for purchase after the program. Um, entitled Frog Hollow, Stories from an American Neighborhood, published by Wesleyan University Press. Please join me in welcoming Susan. Thank you. We'll see if you clap when I'm finished. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I, I, I'm thrilled to be here. The old state house is just incredible. Um, if you'll notice, it's a little small, but I have created a PowerPoint. My four years working full time at a college, in a college classroom, has shown me that I'm not that interesting. But if I toss up a new picture every once in a while, people are apt to pay attention. So prepare yourself for a new picture every once in a while and pay attention. I've spent every conversation I've had about this book feeling a little weird. I'm an accidental author and an even more accidental historian. My reticence to rebrand myself involves my deep belief in truth and advertising. I was in my 40s before I let someone call me a writer. I'm a journalist. In my mind, a writer makes stuff up. A journalist, if she wants to keep her job, does not. The sad fact is I went into journalism originally so that I could be a writer, specifically a novelist. In my mind, the hierarchy of writing goes poet, there at the top, followed by short story writer, precision of word choice is everything, followed by novelists who weave universes out of their imaginations and then their journalists. We mostly just take notes, I say that with love. Nevertheless, along the way, I did write a novel, it's horrible, it involves a moose. And if I call it an allegory, I am stretching the truth. I drag that novel around like a tail, and when I start to think I'm pretty special, I pull it out, I read it, and I remind myself that I am not. My novel and my interior life suffers from a lack of imagination. When I was a girl, we used to play a game called tin-like, as in pretend as if you are a princess riding a dragon. 
And I would stand there and gamely try to imagine myself astride a dragon and come up with nothing. Sailor gear. Along my way to writing my truly bad novel, I realized that why I love, while I love sentences, I also love facts. And I love finding out stuff, research. And I realized that journalism, what was supposed to be a station on the track to my being a famous novelist, would allow me to do research and have a front row seat to a long series of stories. But before I get too deep into things, I need to lower your expectations further. I am not that much of a public speaker. I am way better at a keyboard. My older brother, Dan, that's him and looking angry in a tux, is the public speaker in my family. He's pastor at Dudley Springs Church in Sarcoxy, Missouri, where every Sunday he sends the entire congregation to hell and back with his rhetorical skills. I do not fall for his flourishes because I grew up a witness to them and I am immune. All those hours spent in our family mobile debating society in the back seat of a series of rusty Fords have served me well. But I can see where he has an effect on people, and I have to at least give him that, even if I'm jealous. I tell you all this so that when I'm finished, you don't have to turn to the person next to you and say, she's not that much of a public speaker. <laughs> I know. I have made peace with that, and it's only an hour. You can too. What I am is a congenital storyteller, as you might expect, given my many years laboring in the field of journalism. I grew up in a family of storytellers and liars, and I spent a good part of my girlhood trying to figure out who fell into which camp. Weirdly, for all the cussing and discussing that went on in my family during our loud debates over absolutely everything, we did not pay much attention to our own place in the American story, though the first Scottish family member, Robert Campbell, Came to, the six, came to Jamestown in the 1600s, and another family member met the boat, or at least they met someone along our migration west. My family is featured in Jim Webb's book, Born Fighting. We are part of the Scot-Irish diaspora that traveled along the ridges from Virginia to Tennessee and out to the Missouri Ozarks, where my forefathers and mothers took one look around and said, yeah, let's stop. They sunk their plows into red clay and hoped for the best. I figured out later that the family was silent on our own illustrious history because our history is not that illustrious. But then we were silent about a lot of uncomfortable things. Bleeding Kansas occurred not 20 miles from where I grew up in southwest Missouri. Jesse James rode through those hills. Family members rode with Bloody Bill Quantrell. The bandit Bell Star kept a hideout nearby and police once had a shootout with Bonnie and Clyde next door in Joplin, but the police were bad shots and Bonnie and Clyde got away. I only learned all this later. I also only learned later that Robert, the original Campbell to first touch American soil, was a horse thief of immensely small talent. He was caught multiple times in Scotland relieving his neighbors of their rides, and so he was asked to leave. He moved to Ireland, where he continued his trade with the same results and they asked him to leave. And so he boarded a ship to Jamestown. While I believe years ago, one of my aunts, my racist Aunt Virginia, applied for membership in the Jamestown Society, I assume she was only accepted if they graded on a curve. <laughs> I honestly have never checked if we got in or not. It seems beside the point. But I revel in my family's tawdry history. Anyone can say they're related to George Washington. An unskilled, horse thief begat me. <laughs> Untold stories and half-truths were part of my formal education as well. I sit through years of history and social studies classes where the Civil War was called the War of Northern Aggression, where both military leaders, Grant and Lee, were held in equal regard. Fine people on both sides, right? Our textbooks called the conflict by its proper name, the Civil War, but who are you going to believe? a textbook or a teacher standing at the front of class wielding a grade book over your head. War of Northern Aggression it was. I grew up, as did many people in my tribe, believing that the Confederate battle flag was strictly a symbol for rebellion and what hairy-legged, buck-toothed little girl doesn't want to be a rebel. This is me with my step-grandfather on his porch in Crane, Missouri. We just spent the day at Silver Dollar City, a kind of hillbilly nirvana slash tacky theme park in Branson, Missouri, where I'd purchased this flag to hang in my bedroom. 
and there it hung, until one of my teachers drew the connection for me between the Civil War, not the War of Northern Aggression, and slavery. I was only half listening that day when Mr. Green mentioned states' rights, but then he said states' rights was strictly a surface explanation of the Civil War, that states wanted to retain rights in order to retain the ability to enslave people. He drew that connection for us and I remember all of us looking from one to the other like a fish at the bottom of the boat. Well, my God, I thought, what else haven't you told me? I went home angry that this had been kept from me, and as soon as my mother came through the door, I stopped her with an indignant, did you know? But she'd voted for George Wallace for president before he reformed himself, so my newfound knowledge fell on deaf ears. It wasn't long before... I realized that finding out stuff was actually on me. It was my responsibility. And that further ignited me in a search for truth, which is a fancy way of saying I would no longer accept the stories that were told to me as truthful or factual. I would check, which made me one of the more annoying students in every class I graced. <laughs> All of this is great training for truth seekers or for anyone who wants to be a participating member of society. We are in an information age, but we don't know what to believe of all the information that's blowing through and past us. What those of us who pay attention know is that the story behind the story is usually far more interesting and fleshes out those facts. The people don't act that way keeps me up at night. I planned my escape from my dusty Missouri town. These are the praying hands I once got arrested for painting the fingernails. <laughs> it's very boring. And one day when my stepfather told me to stop using 25 cent words when a 5 cent word would do, I told him that I was going to grow up and be a writer and I would use whatever words I wanted. Writing became an act of defiance and as I jumped into journalism, I was drawn most to people without a voice. I have interviewed a handful of famous people and up close, they're boring, or I am. I cannot think to ask a question that hasn't been asked of them twice and so I tend to get canned ham answers from famous people. They don't interest me, and there are plenty of people to talk to them anyway. What drew me and kept me in journalism long past my due date were the people whom no one wanted to talk to, people without homes, people tilting at windmills, people who have stories to tell and no one to listen. The stories everyone tells already didn't interest me, and I marched that attitude from the Joplin Globe to the Wichita Eagle Beacon, and finally to America's oldest continuously published newspaper, mother current. At every stop, every time I thought I knew something about a group of people, I'd write a story about them and realize I'm ignorant. I am 60 next birthday, and I have found it's delightful to admit I'm ignorant. It's also great motivation for educating oneself. It's one quibble I have with the word woke, as in aware. Woke to me is like education. It is an unending process, and some of us are spending the rest of our lives catching up. I never tried to explain my interest in stories about the disenfranchised. I never made excuses, but I did argue with the occasional editor who thought I was concentrating too much on the poor and downtrodden. I didn't have too many arguments like that, but I found each one invigorating. Writing those stories were my salvation. They made me feel holy, but holiness is a neighbor to haughtiness. I would give speeches in Connecticut suburbia about journalism and invariably be asked by some well-meaning suburbanite if I actually went into scary old Hartford every day. And I would answer more than a little smugly, only on the days I want to get paid. <laughs> I can now see how insufferable I was. People fed on a steady diet of crime and aberrations from a particular location will start to believe that those aberrations are the norm. For all my years of going into sketchy apartments and iffy neighborhoods, I once got my car radio stolen in Glastonbury. <laughs> I have never considered boycotting Glastonbury. Sometimes the pursuit of truth can be an incredible, incredibly circuitous path. I put my silly, stupid, badly written moose book aside and wrote a memoir because Wally Lamb told me to. I wrote a biography of Isabella Beecher Hooker, Harriet Beecher, Stowe's half-sister because my husband got tired of me talking about her and encouraged me to write a book already. Bless his heart. He was under the mistaken impression that by writing a book, I'd stop talking about the topic. <laughs> Welcome to my book talk, y'all. Fast forward to my waning days at Mother Current. 
For my last five years there, I became that thing in the corner. In the morning, the bosses would announce that they were giving away puppies and rainbows at noon, and I would start cursing, you're nodding your head, Joan, and slamming drawers until I realized, oh, I like puppies. To remove my nasty attitude from my innocent co-workers, I would often take off walking to stomp off my mad, just like my old coaches used to say. I would stomp off my mad, go walk it off, walk it off. But if I headed in one direction on Broad Street, I hit the Asylum Hill neighborhood where there are too many stoplights for me to stomp. And so I headed the other way, into Frog Hollow. What appeared to me to be a down at the heels neighborhood with some wonderful restaurants, that old iffy neighborhoods thing. I'd written stories and columns out of the neighborhood, but never taken much time to do anything more than ring a buzzer and go inside. Now I was walking and I was looking and I would walk among the row upon row of perfect sixes with their postage stamp front yards surrounded by knee-high wrought iron fences and get a feeling of home. Home for me is southwest Missouri, where the universal restaurant mode, motto should be, if you can fry it, you can eat it. <laughs> My hometown is not Hartford, Connecticut, but there I would be feeling all nostalgic, nostalgic and weirdly at home in this Hartford neighborhood. And then it hit, it hit me. By the time I came along, the glory days of my hometown were long behind it. The main industry there, mining, had long since gone, and the leftovers were long main streets with mostly boarded up two-story brick pigeon roosts, and just off to the sides, pilings that were radioactive, and mines that filled with a glowing green water we were forbidden to swim in, so of course we swam in them. My hometown is surrounded by fields of chat piles, the busted up rocks the mining industry left is above the surface evidence that they'd riddled below ground with a honeycomb of tunnels that made the ground completely untrustworthy. You could be sitting in your car at an intersection and all of a sudden the ground would give way and you'd be sitting two feet lower. Those mines are like a million miles of hidey holes in which to stuff the bodies of people who've come to an untimely end. As a cop reporter in Joplin, I was familiar with the interesting ways people found to dispose of bodies. I remember one church picnic at Schifferdecker Park where the bloated body of a man who'd run into somebody's crosshairs came bobbing up in what had been a placid pool. I had a gaggle of seven-year-olds picnicking by the pond the moment he popped up. And on my Sunday school teacher training, no one told me the best way to distract a series of seven-year-olds from the bloated corpse of a man I didn't know. Things are different out there. I'd been told that Webb City, Missouri was once the kind of place where bars outnumbered churches 10 to 1. In my girlhood, that ratio had flipped, and I love Jesus, but I'm easily bored. And I yearned for a more interesting place. I walked around thinking something happened here, and I missed it. I got that same impression with Hartford. All its glory days, manufacturing times where wave after wave of immigrant workers turned out everything from rifles to sewing machines to electric cars to machine tools were behind it. While reporting my thousands of stories from the capital city, I heard the refrain, oh, you should have been here, fill in the blank. More than I heard good morning. Hartford was a town with a wonderful past and an iffy future, but I knew that couldn't be the whole story. That was too easy. And so I'd stomp through Frog Hollow and think, as I had at home, something happened here, and I missed it. And it gnawed at me. So I did what I always do. I started keeping notes for no particular reason other than to pre preserve facts I think are important. This random pursuit of the real story makes me the accidental author, I guess. But for five years, my special obsession was Frog Hollow. 17 acres, 35 square blocks, and just over 16,000 residents between Washington, Capitol, Pope Park, and the northern boundary of Trinity College with a scattering of those perfect sixes. I love those buildings. They were built with a simple functionality that is almost Shaker-esque. Scattered throughout were markers from a radically different time, like the Lyceum, built at the turn of the previous century as an after-school hangout for little Irish youths. Here the children could get hot meals and take part in elocution lessons with the hope that they'd learn to lose those brogues, which they didn't. Frog Hollow is one of the capital city's poorest neighborhoods and is also one of the city's most historic. First members of the Algonquian tribe, the Sukiag, walk there. 
Then a well of astounding capacity was dug that gave birth to the city's first waterworks. Workers were digging a well for Dolly Babcock and they hit a geyser that exploded so quickly that workers had to scramble out of the hole and they lost all their tools. That 100 acre farm mostly ran along where Washington Street is now. And while Dolly ran the farm, her husband Elisha ran one of the country's most outspoken critics of the new government, the American Mercury newspaper. In addition, Frog Hollow was from roughly 1853 to the early 1900s, an industrial powerhouse without compare, not just for Connecticut, but for the nation. Factories turned out tools, bicycles, electric cars, balloons, and guns. Frog Hollow was also the landing strip for generations of immigrants, starting with the Irish, the Italian, followed by Scandinavians, Germans, Polish, French, Canadian, Vietnamese, Colombians, Peru, Peruvians, Ecuadorians, and Dominicans. It was a petri dish for what we're still discussing now. How much room can we set at our table for people who don't look and sound like us? In Hartford in those times, the residents who bumped the Sukiog off the land at first said, whoa, not too many chairs, but the factories needed workers. And so the door was pushed open for a flood of families that changed our nation forever. Frog Hollow is a uniquely American story. In the late 1800s, Hartford was known as Venice of the Park River. No less than 12 book publishers drew the likes of Mark Twain and Harriet Beecher Stowe to build gracious homes in an area that's now known as Nook Farm, just to the north of Frog Hollow. Hartford streets were kept clean by sweepers who dressed in blue uniforms and were known as bluebirds. It was that kind of town. Something happened, and we missed it. Weed sewing machine rivaled Singer sewing machine, but Singer sewing machine had better patent lawyers. I don't know if any of you sew, but if you do, you know the needle comes down, picks up a thread, and makes it doubly. That was weed, not Singer. If you have a good idea, get a patent lawyer. The electric car of the future, the Pope Mobile, rivaled what Henry Ford was doing in Detroit, but Ford, too, had better patent lawyers. This is Colonel Albert Pope. He was a genius, if a little bit flighty. He started first with a starting gun and then a cigarette rolling machine, and then he got hooked on bicycles, but not the bicycles we know, but the velocipedes with the huge front tire, little bitty back tire, no clue how you get on it if you drop out of a tree and hope for the best. <laughs> but he thought that this would be the coming thing, and he knew that Frog Hollow was the center of all manufacturing at the time, so he put one on a train in Boston, rode the train down, got off at the station here in Hartford, somehow got on the bike and took off riding. And it was such an unusual sight that by the time he got over to Weed's sewing machine on Capitol Avenue, what's now Capitol, he had a crowd of kids and bored adults running behind him. My intention was to write a book that went through the history of Frog Hollow, A to B, B to C, C to D, but the whole industrial powerhouse didn't tell you the whole story. That industrial powerhouse was what you saw from a carriage ride. If you stepped out of your carriage and into those factories, you saw a shocking army of children who were handing over their childhoods to feed the booming economy. In 1890, 1 1.5 million children between the ages of 10 and 14 were gainfully employed. Their stories didn't make the newspaper until an enterprising photographer and some local do-gooders, including a librarian, brought their existence to the public at large. Some children worked in factories, some were employed as newsies. These children, some as young as eight, stood on street corners and outside bars to hawk Hartford's newspapers, bars where fruitful drunks liked to read. These were children, but they once organized into a union when their distributors refused to buy back unsold newspapers. The Hartford and Bridgeport newsies struck, and they won. Legislators pressured by the do-gooders and much to the annoyance of factory workers and newspaper publishers, finally enacted child labor laws, mostly because of what was going on here in Hartford. So I kept digging. On the road to writing this book, I li read a library shelf worth of histories, including this one and this one. I am not comparing my book to these at all. But they made me think about story and context and drawing more chairs up to the table. And I began to think of all the stories I wrote for the current, 
that lacked this kind of context and that floated into my, and there floated into my consciousness two phrases. Nothing just happens. And history only answers the questions we ask. Neither of those phrases is original with me, but if we go looking for an illustrious past, George Washington, that's what we'll find, unless you're so blessed to have a horse thief as an ancestor. But what if we ask the harder questions? Where did the African Americans feel welcome in Hartford? Did they feel welcome? What brought the migration of Puerto Ricans starting in the 40s, and how was that group able to build a formidable political force in 40 short years? You can drive through Frog Hollow now, and you may want to keep driving, but that too is only the neighborhood you see from your carriage. Gangs took over the streets in the late 80s and early 90s, much as rum runners and speakeasies took over the streets during Prohibition. And that feels like the story people cling to when it comes to Frog Hollow. A closer look shows generations of state and federal policies that built, for good or for ill, this neighborhood and others. Here's one example. As manufacturers moved to the suburbs and workers began to follow, the federal government also moved away from Frog Hollow. Mortgages in the Depression were not written for 30 years. They were written for five or seven. And the government was dipping its toe into backing up these mortgages so that banks would be protected. In the 1930s, officials from something called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a part of President Roosevelt's New Deal, sent representatives through the streets to make decisions as to the residents' ability to pay, repay mortgages. You've heard of redlining. This comes from the actual maps drawn by the HOLC. The neighborhoods were color-coded, green and blue for the nicer neighborhoods which residents were, it was assumed, capable of paying back mortgages, and yellow and the dreaded red, where banks were encouraged to move on. If you lived in a red neighborhood, your chances of getting a mortgage to buy into that American dream, home ownership, was nil. Representatives for the federal government made these also oh important decisions about neighborhood viability by simply driving through the neighborhoods. They did not get out of their cars. They looked out their windows and they made a check on a form. If a representative spotted a person of color, the neighborhood slipped a few notches. If they saw people who looked like immigrants, there went a few more marks on the paper. Slowly, this neighborhood that had been vital and packed with opportunity began to crumble. Today, if you take those same HOLC maps, and most of Frog Hollow was colored red or yellow, and then overlay a modern map of poverty in Hartford, those neighborhoods that have been disenfranchised for nearly 100 years are still the poorest. Their fate was sealed by people who drove through in a car one day and made a snap decision. People still like to throw rocks at Hartford and neighborhoods like Frog Hollow, but throwing rocks is completely beside the point. And it's akin to punching someone in the nose and then demanding they wipe up their own blood. Listening to the story of the neighborhoods and the people is everything. I recently sat on a panel with the Harper, Hartford Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez. When Dr. Torres Rodriguez was nine, her mother moved her family of three to Hartford. The superintendent talked about how sad she was to leave her island home of Puerto Rico, but then they moved to heavily Hispanic Frog Hollow, and the language and the culture and the food were Puerto Rico. The doctor attended Maria Sanchez Elementary School, named for a powerhouse of a politician, the first Hispanic woman elected to the Connecticut General Assembly with a fourth grade education. And Dr. Torres Rodriguez did what generations of migrants and immigrants have done. She used Frog Hollow as a springboard. She bounced. She attended Yukon and Central, and then she did something really special. She bounced back. She said at that panel that success to her wasn't leaving Hartford. It was coming home and doing her part. For years, immigrants like my husband's grandparents came to Hartford, got their financial feet beneath them, and then they bounced, in his case, to Wethersfield and Glastonbury. They moved to the suburbs to pursue that dream. And maybe that's what fuels so many naysayers when they refer to Hartford. They see Hartford as a place to leave. And for many families, it has been precisely that. But for many families, it's so much more. Hartford is far from a town with its better days behind it. Hartford has a past, a present, and a future, which we can only plan for once we know the past. 
all the past. Sunday baseball, the priests hated it. More newsies. Gathering scrap during World War II. Immaculate Conception, graduation, 1960. Three Kings Day, when they still let the camel walk down the street, they spit. And a wonderful picture taken by Tony DeBoney, one of my favorite photographers. We need to know the past, all of the past, all of Frog Hollow. So now I'm teaching a new generation of journalists how to tell stories, all the stories, how to report accurately and honestly, and give context and spell names correctly. I tell them to use five cent words. I tell them to use 25 cent words. I tell them to use all the words. You've been warned. Thank you. If your questions are really easy, I will <laughs> take questions, but we have a microphone. This is being filmed, so if you don't mind waiting for the microphone so people who watch this later can hear what you said. Any questions? Like, easy one, Donna? Easy? Okay. I always feel like I'm taking a quiz on Frog Hollow. <laughs> I think this is easy. Um, you started walking around and were drawn to certain things. Once you began to get out of your car, so to speak, or your carriage, what was the thing that surprised you the most, or what was a surprise for you that you discovered? This is going to sound so corny, that people would talk to me without a notebook, that I wasn't there as a journalist, I was wandering around. And in a heavily Hispanic neighborhood, I stand out. And occasionally someone would come out on the porch and say, what are you doing? And I I don't know. <laughs> Casing the joint. No, I would say, I'm, I, I don't know, but I read about your house and this used to be a speakeasy. And, and, and then it would just be a conversation. And I think what surprised me was that people wanted to hear more about their neighborhood. You know, I thought I just appeared and then Missouri appeared after me, you know, waiting for me. And as I got older and learned all the really gritty, interesting um, history, I understand that same draw for a place like Frog Hollow. So I was most thrilled when people wanted to talk to me. Which is, as a journalist, of course, I make them talk to me. But in this case, it was just chatting. It felt, it felt like home. That is so corny. I, okay. Yes, over here. And then we'll come back to you. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, um, because I'm sorry I came in late. Um, I, was, I teach a class on Harper History for the Cultural Center. You, when you did, you taught there in mm -hmm. the beginning. I've been only there five years teaching, uh, four semesters every year, free if anybody's interested. Uh, however, I'm sorry, get to my question. Um, do you uh, know about the corner of Park and Broad? What gentleman started a pawn shop there? And I don't it know later the name. became the jewelry store in Hartford. I don't know 35 his name. 35 steps from Maine. The, I the older the people will remember. Bill, Bill Savitt. He started a pawn shop. Oh, that's where it started. On the corner of uh, Park in Maine. You know, I, I have to insert here that every time I give a talk, someone says, tells me a story, like either I'm familiar with it or forgot, and I think, oh, that would have been so good in the book. I need to stop giving talks. <laughs> um, one gentleman met me before. It was my first talk about the book at all. And he met me at the door and he had a list of names I should have included. And I'm like, oh my God, I, how did I overlook these people? And I go back, they're not even on the web, but they're people he knew and they should have been in there. <laughs> it's like, but yeah, I did not include Bill Savitt. Sorry, Bill, wherever you are. Yeah? Yeah. It, pass it on to the not only the younger generation, but the older generation didn't know a lot of, a lot of things because they lived maybe in another part of town. Yeah, and, and, and Frog Hollow is a, a world unto itself. Within a city. That's just what like it felt oldies, like, that Park just Street. Just like the old east side was. There you go. Where we used to go shopping. Like the world ended at the end of the streets, and that's yeah. how people approach it. And I've never, even my own neighborhood, which I loved growing up in, I don't have that same connection. Like people who've grown up in Frog Hollow. Okay, where'd you go to school? What town? We lived on these streets. It's very cool. Bill Savitt. Totally forgot him. 
we'll come to you next. What did you learn about politics in Frog Hollow? Uh, any political organizations, uh, any prominent uh, persons from Frog Hollow who emerged in city politics, how they fit into the city administration? What, what I found most interesting, I just mentioned it briefly, was the, the Puerto Rican contingent that built their political power literally in 40 years, starting at Sacred Heart Church in the basement, uh, San Juan Center, and they trained every name you can think of. So Maria Sanchez, to me, rises to the top. Um, she was responsible for far more than being at the General Assembly. She was la madrina. She was the godmother. Um, be before that particular political block, there were a series of men who were considered mayor of Frog Hollow who were fixers. They just made stuff happen. And, and that dates back to, wow, as, as er the earliest person I read about was like 1870. Like, you want, you want something to go see John. But I, they never rose to the level of citywide politics. I think they were happy in their own little fiefdoms. But Maria Sanchez, absolutely. Dan, did you have a question? Yeah. Hang on just a second. He'll bring you. <laughs> Stop it. Hi. I didn't hear you mention the uh, French or Lithuanian cultures in Frog mm -hmm. Hollow, nor the Underwood and Royal factories that really contribute a great deal to that whole area. Yeah, I mentioned French Canadian just briefly. They're in the book. Um, Royal is considered more Parkville. Underwood, Underwood I'm sorry. Underwood. Um, right in the center of it. Say it again. Underwood is in, in the center of the neighborhood. Okay, yeah. It's, I didn't mention it in the talk, but it's in the book. So, what was the other one? Lithuanian and, and French cultures. Yeah. St. Anne's Church. Oh, yeah, big time. That's in here, in the book. It's a small talk, sorry. <laughs> But again, there are so many things I now wish I could go back in and change, and there's discussion of making this a multimedia presentation, and I've got my notes, I'm still going. So, yeah, St. Anne's had a huge effect on the neighborhood. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Are you French Canadian? Susan, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned you had gotten a really good reception about your book and you're doing a lot of talks. How has the reception been in the Frog Hollow neighborhood amongst folks who actually live there and or, or are former residents? They know their neighborhood. So there's a misspelling of a street in there, shame on me. I hear that every time. I promise we're fixing it. Next, next. Um, it's been good. We're talking, uh, Wesleyan University Press is talking about putting out uh, an edition in Spanish. And there's discussion, just discussion, within Hartford schools of making it a book that all the students have to read, just because this is your neighborhood. The reception's been, that was one of the first talks I, I've been in the neighborhood quite a bit. And it's been real, again, I'm hearing these stories thinking, I wish I'd included that. That's really good. Um, it's been good. This is not a big book. I always, I write books I want to read, and then I, I don't get famous or rich, which is <laughs> kind of my pattern. But I, I just, I just became so enamored of this neighborhood and all the things that have washed through it and all the themes that continue to today that that were answered at one point in Frog Hollow. You know, we, we don't appreciate orphanages, but one of the first orphanages in the country was where Burns School is now, there as well. Um, the idea of social service agencies through churches, they were heavy there because there was so much need in the neighborhood. The neighborhood has never been a wealthy neighborhood. Um, and so there was always beneficial societies, um, widows societies there. And, and they made it work. And there were a lot of different kinds of people, different ethnicities, and they, they made it work. And, and it just felt like these are lessons that we could learn from now. Oh, okay. Just a quick question. I, I know that there's um, a growing Brazilian population in Hartford, and I, are they in um, Frog Hollow as well? Some, some. Okay. somewhat, okay. yeah, a little more West End, but some. Okay. And, and if you ask me about any other neighborhoods, I'm just going to wave to you because someone asked me, are you going to write about Clay Arsenal? No. <laughs> no, I'm good. This took five years. I'll be dead by the time the next one came up. But yeah, it's so, sort of on the edge. 
Why is it called Frog Hollow? Oh, thank you. I forgot that part. <laughs> Not because of French Canadians. Um, the name Frog Hollow shows up before there was such a large influx of French Canadians. It literally is called Frog Hollow because of the amphibians. It's a marshy area. Um, in the springtime, the, the the old well bubbles up, the, the streets are muddy. There was a big to-do about whether or not to pave the streets because they figured they would be washed away with the spring. Um, frogs, frogs, frog hollow. There you go. Forgot that part. Thanks for asking. Yes. You can have another, yeah. So you talked about your novel, which you, you know, it's you're awful. awful. Yeah. Um, what are, are you, you mentioned a few books that you read during the course of writing this book. What are you reading now? What am I reading yeah. now? I'm going back and rereading The Trail of Tears uh, and getting angry all over again. Um, I'm going back and reading a lot of books that I gave short shrift to in college because you know, I passed the test, but I don't, can't say I actually read. I'm going, I went to the Hartford Seminary, which is where I met Donna. I'm going back and actually reading those books I was supposed to read for Hartford Seminary. <laughs> I got good grades there, but I can't tell you what I read. So this is summer, and I'm not teaching, so I'm actually reading. It's awesome. What are you reading? What should I read? Um, I just picked up Elizabeth. I'm a novel reader. Hmm. Liz Gilbert's new book, City of Girls. Okay. Um, read which about I'm it. finding interesting. Um, I read. Um, oh, the name is Leaf Enger. Somebody help me out. Who reads novels? Um, None of us do. <laughs> Virgil Wander. Oh, okay. Virgil Wander. That was the best book I read last year. Oh, it's all right. stunningly beautiful. I'll write it down. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hello. This isn't really a question, but it's like uh, you actually went to Hartford Seminary? Mm -hmm. what, what? I mean, I think that's great. Thanks. Did, did you enjoy it? Yes. I went to Hartford Seminary because I grew up Christian fundamentalist, and I found myself able to quote large portions of the Bible but not tell you anything but the actual verses. I could still do the books of the Bible in one breath. Not really. It takes two. But I just thought it was time to figure out my theology. I went there for a, uh, there is, they have a seminar at night. Right. And I went there for one where it said, oh, this is how you tell stories. And it, it had a, thank you, there was a uh, uh, one on the Arabian Nights. I don't know if you remember that day, right? Yeah, right. that's excellent. It's a great excellent. resource. I highly recommend the seminary. Radicalized me, but there you go. <laughs> I want to thank you very much there. I still have a few of these left. I want to thank Sarah for signing, for interpreting. That means a lot. Any other questions? OK, one more, Rebecca. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming to the State House today for today's program. We're delighted to see you. And so, Susan, we've had you speak a couple times now. So my question is, do you have plans for a next book? Yes. <laughs> Any details you can give us? Uh-uh. <laughs> Not yet. I have a couple that I'm juggling, and then I'm just going to put them on a wall, throw a dart, and that'll be the one I do. It's really fun to have a big project. Whether you're a writer or you're refinishing furniture, to have something in the corner that you can beat yourself over the head with. So, yeah, there'll be another one. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry.